Good afternoon. Uh, we are here today for this uh, seminar, this very interesting seminar, so uh, with uh, Professor Killian. Uh, we start today this afternoon with uh, the, our uh, economic modeling seminar. So you can see now there is a second, so we are starting a new series. Uh, and uh, we started with these uh, um, seminars are organized by um, uh, Fondazione Enrico Mattei, University of British and Italian Association of Environmental Resource Economists, uh, with the support of European University Institute, uh, Università di Siena, University of Siena, uh, University of Padua, Department of Environmental Science and Policy of University of Milan. And uh, uh, now we, I remember a little bit the first edition that uh, concluded in 2021. We started with Professor Pindaik, uh, Professor Hill, Svart, Toll, uh, Professor Bergman, Gollier, Van der Plug, uh, Gerlag, uh, Professor Konduri, uh, uh, Professor Nordhauser during our uh, conference uh, uh, in April in the Italian Association of Environmental Resource Economists, also, also Professor Pindaik. We started uh, with uh, Professor Metcalf, uh, Professor Stevens, and uh, uh, the last was uh, Professor Spence and Professor Mendelssohn. Now we'll start today uh, with Professor uh, Killian, uh, and after I will present a little bit of a professor not giving, before leaving, leaving the floor to him. Uh, before uh, doing this, uh, I start to uh, remember you next, uh, our next events. Uh, so the next uh, seminar in our series is, uh, will be with uh, Professor uh, Linsky, that is uh, now is scheduled for the 3rd of uh, March 2022. We will have also Professor Stern, Professor Schmalzi uh, in April, on April. So also Professor uh, Greenstone, Rogoff, uh, and Professor Sachs, uh, Sachs, and also Professor uh, Spencer for the next, uh, maybe in uh, the um, summer. Uh, I remember also to all the um, members, not, not members, but to all the uh, participants that we are organizing, organizing also the uh, 10th uh, Italian Association of Environmental Resource Economies Annual Conference will be held in the uh, uh, University of Cagliari, uh, 21 and 23rd of April. Uh, the, we can see also the very important you know, speaker that we will have uh, in April. And uh, I remember that the call for papers deadline will be on February uh, 18. So if you have uh, some papers, uh, remember uh, to um, submit to our um, conference. Uh, but we will send to you also a reminder on this. Now I present Professor, uh, uh, Professor Killian. Um, Professor Killian is a Senior Economic uh, Policy Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Dallas, Fellow of, of the International Association of Applied Econometrics, and Fellow of uh, um, a Society for Economic Measurement. About his topics, uh, time series econometrics, empirical macroeconomics, energy economics, and uh, um, more of uh, much of his recent research is uh, concerned with uh, uh, sources of fluctuation for in the price of oil. Uh, also today is one of the topics that we said with respect to today. Transmission of oil prices shocked uh, to the US economy, the role of uh, specula speculation in global oil markets, uh, measuring oil price expectation and oil price forecast. Um, about uh, his uh, uh, bio, uh, so it's a very, very long, so he, uh, we collect a little bit uh, <laughs> on, on the things that uh, are in his uh, uh, curriculum vitae. Uh, well, he, he was a senior economic policy advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, professor at the University of Michigan, advisor at ECB European Central Bank, research associate in Inter-American Development Bank in 1991. I was also a research visitor European ECB, European Central Bank, a research visitor Federal Reserve, a research visitor International Monetary Fund, and also has been consultant for IMF, International American Development Bank, WTO, ECB, Bank of Canada, European Parliament, and the US Energy Information Administration, among others. Long, the list is very, very long. About his research, um, a long list of papers in the top uh, list of papers that are in our list. So, Economic American Economy Review, Journal Economic Literature, Poli Journal Political Economy, Journal Economic uh, Perspectives, among others, uh, more than uh, 100 articles. About books, uh, there, are, there is a collection book uh, in which you can see also very rare the topic, uh, also, especially also uh, the topic of today. So, we're speaking about uh, energy uh, prices, uh, microeconomics, uh, 
So there is also something related to asymmetric effect of energy price shock. Um, no linearities in the oil price output relationship, uh, and also there are a lot of non linearities again in some asymmetric related to oil price. And also there is a, a technical book on uh, structural vector autographic analysis. Um, among other things, uh, I remember also that uh, Professor Killian is uh, in the top uh, uh, tenth uh, percent of uh, authors in the field of energy economics, in particular, is uh, the first. Uh, uh, position uh, according to the ideas ranking uh, worldwide. So it's one of the most important uh, researchers. And for me, it's uh, a very, very uh, big honor to have uh, here uh, Professor Killian. Uh, the title of the presentation is Oil Prices, Gasoline Prices, and Inflation Expectations. It's perfect in line with what is uh, um, happening in these days uh, in Europe, Italy, in, uh, US, and so on. So it's a, a topic that is uh, uh, in the newspaper also in these days, so we are living with uh, one of these problems of so the rise of inflation uh, driven also by uh, energy prices. Uh, and so in a second, I leave the floor to Professor Kinnion to uh, attend to his uh, uh, seminar. Before uh, doing this, uh, I remember that uh, if you want, uh, at the end of the uh, seminar, we will have uh, um, 20 minutes for Q&A session. It's possible to write uh, uh, in uh, our, our chat, uh, and so I, uh, after that I, uh, I read that to the Professor uh, Killian in order to have uh, some answers. Um, now I leave the floor uh, and I thank everybody and thank uh, Professor Killian. Good afternoon and uh, thank you for <clears throat> this introduction. So this uh, is joint work with Shao Jing Zhou, also at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, and the usual disclaimers for work done at the Federal Reserve apply. It's well known that survey data of household inflation expectations may differ substantially from forecasts of inflation generated by professional forecasters. One possible explanation uh, out there is that household inflation expectations are more responsive to fluctuations in the price of gasoline than forecast by professional forecasters. Now, why might that be? Well, the usual argument is that gasoline prices are more visible to consumers than any other price. That is, if you drive to work, uh, then you're gonna pass by gas stations in the morning, you see the price, you're gonna pass by several gas stations in the afternoon, you're gonna see the price again. If you compare this to buying milk in the grocery store, well, you might do that twice a week, uh, but that's not as frequent as the gasoline price. There's a widely cited paper by Koibin and Gordichenko in the AJ Macro in 2015 that really articulated this view for the first time, and they concluded that almost all of the short-run volatility of household inflation expectations appears explained by changes in the level of the price of oil and hence in the price of gasoline. And this view really has become part of the mainstream since then. Nowadays, many people write papers where they start off by saying, as shown by Koivit Gordichenko, this is a well-established fact. So you might say, why do macroeconomists get excited about this fact? And, and that requires some additional explanation. It has to do with the expectations augmented Phillips curve. Now, the conventional Phillips curve might look something like this. You, you link the inflation rate pi t to a constant plus the deflation expectations typically by professional forecasters plus beta times the unemployment rate or some other measure of economic slack. The problem is when you take this Phillips curve to the data, the um, fitted values uh, of this regression relationship predict much lower inflation in 2009 to 2013 than actually observed. That's sometimes referred to as the missing disinflation in the data. Now, if instead you take the same Phillips curve and you replace the professional forecast by uh, household inflation expectations from the Michigan Survey of Consumers, you find that you get a much better fit. 
And that's illustrated in the picture below. You see the black line, that's actual inflation. The dashed black line, that is the fitted value of a Phillips curve based on professional inflation forecasts. And comparing those two black lines, you see that they look quite different, especially between 2009 and 2013. If instead you work with the Michigan Survey of Consumers data, you get the dotted red line, which tends to be closer um, most of the time to the black line than the dashed line employed by the SPF. And so the argument made by Corbyn Gordichenko was to say not only that this is true in the data, but that the reason for the difference between the SPF and the MSC specification is that households respond to gasoline prices, in particular to the increase in gasoline prices after the uh, Great Recession, starting in early 2009, uh, whereas uh, professional forecasters do not. And so he provide, they provide an explanation of this fact. So what made them reach this conclusion? Well, the baseline estimation period in their paper starts in 1981 Q3 and ends in 2013 Q1, as shown in the first column, the column that's highlighted in yellow. Let me talk about the upper panel first, because that's what's reported in their paper. They report, first of all, the correlation between the difference between one-year household inflation expectations and one-year professional inflation forecasts with the dollar price of crude oil measured by the WTI price. And they report that this correlation is quite high. It's 78% in fact. They then run a regression of this inflation expectations spread variable on a constant and the oil price, OT, and report that the T statistic for the coefficient in front of the oil price is 13, which is off the chart, and that the R squared of this regression is 61%, which is quite high. Now, if you go in the upper panel from left to right, you see that this result is quite robust to other estimation periods discussed in their work, and it is quite robust to updating these estimation periods until early 2020. There's only one thing that may seem a little bit odd here, which is that the story that they told us and that I reiterated on my first slide is about the relationship between household inflation expectations and the oil price. It is not about the relationship between the difference between household inflation expectations and professional expectations and the oil price. Now, obviously, Koivu and Gordichenko are aware of this. And so if you read their paper, they're telling you, don't worry that we put in the uh, expectations from the survey of professional forecasters, because we happen to know that these inflation expectations do not respond to changes in oil prices. And so therefore, in other words, it shouldn't make a difference whether we include minus pi t expectation SPF or not. It turns out that this is mistaken, and that's shown in the lower panel, where for the same estimation period, I show that the correlation between household inflation expectations and the oil price isn't 78%, it's actually only 11%. And the T statistic isn't 13, it's actually just one. And the R squared isn't 61%, it's actually just 1%. And it turns out what's worse is that if you look at different estimation periods, that relationship between household inflation expectations and oil prices is terribly unstable. For example, the correlations may be as low as 4% or as high as 74%, depending on which period you happen to look at. So the question is, what's going on? And the short answer is, this isn't driven by the relationship between household expectations and the oil price, because that coefficient, if you look at the beta hat, is essentially zero. This is actually driven by the SPF inflation forecast. It turns out that you can show that the coefficient on the SPF inflation forecast alone is actually quite high 
and statistically significant, and it is of the wrong sign, by which I mean that you might have thought that if the oil price goes up, professional forecasters will raise their inflation expectations, but in the data, they actually lower their expectations quite a bit. And because that lowering of expectations is interacted with a negative sign in front of the SPF expectations term, that gives you the large positive results reported in Koyvi and Gornichenko. So what that tells you is that if you want to understand what's going on, the first thing you need to do is to get rid of the SPF data in this relationship. What we really need to look at is the relationship between household inflation expectations and the oil price, as shown in equation one. What we're doing here is essentially what Koyvi and Gordichenko try to do, which is to test the null that these two variables are mutually uncorrelated by testing the null that beta is equal to zero. Um, that can be done based on a simple t-test with robust standard errors. And I'm going to do that now with two uh, changes relative to the results I showed you earlier. The first one is that I'm going to work with monthly data rather than quarterly data. There is a table in the paper that shows that this makes absolutely no difference. The results are virtually alike whether you do monthly or quarterly data. The reason why I work with monthly data is that later I'm going to compare this to other classes of regression models that can only be estimated at monthly frequency and I want to make the results compatible. The second thing is that rather than starting in 1981, I'm going to start estimating this regression in 1990. And the reason is that when you look at the graphical evidence in Koyvi and Gordichenko, the plot of the data, it's quite apparent that the relationship Koyvi and Gordichenko hypothesized looks stronger after 1990 than before. And so the results I'm going to show you here, you might interpret as the best possible case for the hypothesis that Koivin and Gordichenko have in mind. I obviously could redo the analysis with data back to 1981. That would imply that all the results would look even weaker. So there is no loss of generality in doing that. Now, having said that, if I take equation one and I take it to the data, what I find is a correlation of inflation expectations with the oil price of only 29%. Not particularly impressive. And if I run a regression of um, regression model one, I find an R squared of 9% and a T statistic of 1.83. So this is a far cry from the results reported in the original paper. But it turns out there's some reasons to be skeptical of this baseline regression. One reason is that the regressor on the right hand side is expressed in dollars per barrel. In other words, it's expressed in levels. It is not expressed in logs. So let's think about this for a moment. Now, clearly, when you pass by a gas station and you see that a gallon of gasoline costs $3.09, well, that's a price in dollars and cents. This doesn't mean, however, that households necessarily change their inflation expectations proportionately to the change in the gasoline price in dollars and cents. And the reason is that they're trying to understand the overall inflation rate in the economy. The overall inflation rate is the percent change in the price level. So if I told you, you can only see one price, and that price happens to be the gasoline price, and you wanted to use that as a proxy for the overall inflation rate, the natural thing to do would be to look at the percent change in that price as a proxy for the percent change in the overall price level. But that would require you to put the regression in logs on both sides. And, sorry, on the right-hand side. So another way of thinking about that is to say if this argument is reasonable, then a consumer should respond more strongly to an increase in the gasoline price from $1 to $1.05, because that's a 5% increase after all, 
then a consumer would respond to an increase from $4 to $4.05, because that's, after all, only about a 1% increase. And if you think that that's reasonable, that's telling you you definitely want to put the right-hand side regressor in logs, whether you're working with the gasoline price or the oil price. And I'm going to call that regression one prime. So let's look at what this implies. In the first column of the table, you see the baseline result I showed you earlier. In the second column on the right, you see the corresponding results when you take logs. What happens is the correlation drops from 29% to 20%. The R squared drops from 9% to 4%. The T statistic drops from 1.83 to 1.25. So this does make a difference. Here's another thing you might worry about. Why is it that the oil price is a good proxy for the gasoline price? In fact, it's, it's kind of odd that Koibin and Gornichenko spent all this time arguing that households, that consumers respond to gasoline prices because they can see those prices every time they pass by a gas station. And yet, in their regressions, they don't use the gasoline price, which is readily available, but they use the price of crude oil. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense because if you uh, picked a random consumer on the sidewalk and you asked them, oh, what's today's price of crude oil? They would uh, basically uh, stare at you and wouldn't know what to say because no consumer has ever bought crude oil. Crude oil is being bought by refiners. People don't know what the price of crude oil is. They do know what the price of gasoline is. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong to use the oil price specification, but if you want to argue for this, you have to argue that changes in the oil price are the only source of changes in the gasoline price, and that they're being passed on proportionately and immediately. Now, if you happen to talk to an oil economist about that, they will tell you right away that this is not likely to be true. And there's some discussion in the paper of this point. I don't want to get into this right now, so I'm going to propose something much simpler, which is to say, look, we don't know whether it makes a difference a priori. How about we replace the oil price regressor by a gasoline price regressor. If Koibi and Gornichenko are right that this doesn't make a difference, well, then the results should be about the same. So are they? The answer is no. So, for example, if you move from uh, the level of the oil price to the level of the gasoline price, you drop, the correlation drops from 29 to 22 percent, the R squared drops to 5 percent, the T-statistic is 1.26. If you now interact this with the log specification, you actually drop from 29% correlations to 15%, from a 9% R-squared to 2%, and the T-statistic drops from 1.83 to 0 0.81. So this makes a huge difference, suggesting that the shortcut of running regressions on the oil price maybe was not such a good idea. Here's another concern. Now, I've been reporting T-statistics so far without saying much about them, and that's because we have to be careful with how to evaluate the T-statistic, regardless of which specification we're working with. It turns out that the normal 0-1 critical values used in the existing literature, including Koivy and Gornichenko, are not appropriate in this context, and it's very easy to see why. Now, our dependent variable, inflation expectations here, is plausibly I0, plausibly stationary. But our regressor on the right-hand side clearly is not A0. It's either I1, integrated of order 1, or maybe a nonlinear transformation of an I1 variable. In other words, it's very persistent. Now, if you regress one variable on another, and they have different orders of integration, that regression is known to be unbalanced. That's the technical term. And what we know is that the distribution of the t-statistic of an unbalanced regression tends to be far from normal zero one. This is something that econometricians have studied at length, and they have shown that this is a particular concern when the dependent variable is positively serially correlated, as is most definitely the case with household inflation expectations. <laughs> 
Now, before I move on, let me address one uh, objection one may raise, which is to say, yeah, but what if inflation expectations are actually I-1 or close to I-1? Well, in that case, you will be regressing one I-1 variable on another I-1 variable, and that is known as a spurious regression to indicate that the t-statistic in that case has a distribution that's also very different from a normal zero one uh, distribution. And so whichever way you interpret this, the original normal zero one critical values are not appropriate. So how can we deal with this? How can we generate critical values that actually are appropriate? Well, here's a simple thought experiment. Suppose we write down a bivariate model for household inflation expectations and for the log price of oil that embodies the restriction that these two variables are mutually uncorrelated, that is, that beta is equal to zero. That's not too hard. We're going to postulate that inflation expectations follow an autoregression with Gaussian errors. For simplicity, I'm going to assume it's an AR1, but nothing would change if you made it an AR4 or something like that. And I'm going to postulate that the log price of oil follows a random walk, possibly with a drift near naught, and has an error term that is fat tailed, that is in particular a student T4 um, uh, innovation. Now, empirically, when you take these two regressions to the data and you estimate them, you're going to find that the drift mu naught in the data is actually essentially zero. So what that is saying is that the log price of oil is well approximated by a random walk without drift with fat tailed innovations. So when I have fitted these two equations to the actual data, I can do essentially what you might call a bootstrap, which is I'm going to generate data from these consistently estimated regressions under the null uh, of the same length as the original data. I can do this 100,000 times if I like. And for each of the 100,000 data sets I simulate from this process, I can fit the regression and do the t-test. I'm interested in the t-test that was reported earlier. That allows me to build up the empirical distribution of the t-statistics under the null and to read off the critical values and the marginal significance levels. And if I'm interested not in the log price of oil, but the level, well, I just exponentiate the simulated data for little ot. And if I'm interested in the gasoline price, I can repeat the exercise recalibrating the parameters uh, after replacing the oil price by the gasoline price. So this is not too hard. This is what the finite sample null distribution for the t-test looks like. I'm going to show results for the oil price and logs and the gasoline price and logs. They're very similar. Notice there are two distributions here. As a reference point, I first plotted the normal 0, 1 distribution as a dotted red line. <clears throat> That's the distribution used in Koyvi and Gordonichenko. And then I plotted in blue the finite sample null distribution. What you see is that both of these distributions are centered on zero. The difference is that the blue distribution has much fatter tails. In other words, it moves probability mass from the center of the distribution, where it's found in the normal zero one, to the tails. What that implies is, intuitively, that you, if you use the critical values from the normal zero one, they would be far too small. In other words, you would be much more likely to reject the null that there is no correlation between these variables in favor of there being a correlation um, than you should. So, we can also compute the marginal significance levels or p-values for the four regression specifications I discussed earlier. And it turns out that in no case, for none of those specifications, is there any evidence that the t-test is statistically significant at the 1%, 5%, or 10% level. And the more realistic you make that specification, the bigger the p-value, the marginal significance level becomes. So what that is saying is there is not a shred of evidence to support the conclusions from these types of regressions in the original analysis. Now, you might say, well, if we can agree 
that the uh, log oil price or the log gasoline price is I won, meaning that it has a unit route, then couldn't we just regress um, inflation expectations on the growth rate of the oil price? And you could. If you did that, you would find a correlation of 14%. You would get a significant T statistic uh, with, with, with a standard uh, normal zero one distribution. Um, however, the R squared on that regression would be only 2%. Put differently, 98% of the variation in inflation expectations does not seem to co move with the oil price. If you switch to the gasoline price, which I argued earlier might be what you want to do because that is more closely linked to what households actually look at, you find even more significant results, a somewhat higher correlation, and an R squared of 6%. So that's good. It's telling you, indeed, the gasoline price seems to be the more appropriate variable here. But the problem is, even in that case, 94% of the variation in inflation expectations is not correlated with the gasoline price. So this is kind of the opposite of uh, the story um, that uh, Corbyn Gordychenko tried to tell about almost all of the variability, nearly 100% being explained. So, the other point you have to keep in mind is, of course, that none of those regressions technically speaks to whether there is a causal relationship. These are just correlations. So if you want to make this about causal relationships, there is a missing step, which is not in Corbin Gordichenko's paper. Now, you can extend this to look at correlations. I, I do that in the paper. I'm not going to do that here, except to say that by design, when you have an unbalanced regression relationship, the correlations between those two variables will be time varying and extremely erratic, exactly as reported earlier in one of those tables. And that's exactly the same problem as the instability in the regression coefficient. So what that means is that neither static regressions nor reduced form correlations are the appropriate tool for understanding this empirical relationship. So in the second part of the paper, I'm going to tackle this in a different way by introducing a structural vector autoregressive model that disentangles the relationship between the nominal price of gasoline, headline CPI inflation, and inflation expectations. The important point here is that, like Corwin Gordonchenko's original analysis, this model is explicitly behavioral. That is, we're trying to measure the response of household inflation expectations to unexpected changes in the price of gasoline. That, of course, doesn't mean that there isn't a deeper underlying economic model uh, to understand these results. And indeed, I'm going to talk a little bit about alternative economic interpretations of this behavioral relationship. So what are the advantages of doing a VR compared to static regressions? Well, first, you can account for the endogeneity of the real price of gasoline with respect to domestic inflation variables. Second, when you run static regressions, you implicitly assume that whatever feedback there is, is instantaneous within the same month or the same quarter. This is an assumption we can relax in a structural VR model. What we can allow for is that an unexpected change in the oil or gasoline price takes time to be transmitted to inflation expectations. As a side product, this allows us to quantify the cumulative effect of nominal gasoline price shocks on household inflation expectations, which is absolutely crucial for the debate about the expectations augmented Phillips curve. And so I'm, I'm going to showcase how to do that later in the presentation. And finally, it can be shown that the VAR results are quite robust to changes in the model specification and identification, and they're also robust over time, unlike the static regression analysis. So the baseline structural VR model is quite simple. We have three variables, the log level of the real gasoline price, headline CPI inflation, and the one-year mean inflation expectations of households in the Michigan survey of consumers. Uh, that's the same expectations measure that Corbyn Gornichenko used 
I'm going to set the lag order to 12. That's probably a conservative upper bound. And I'm going to identify three structural shocks. The first one is a nominal gasoline price shock. Now, let me stress that even though in the model, the variable is the real price of gasoline, the shock I'm identifying is a nominal gasoline price shock because that's what people see at the gas station. So if you have a positive nominal gasoline price shock, that's going to raise the real price of gasoline on impact intuitively because the CPI overall responds more slowly than the nominal price of gasoline to the shock. Intuitively, it takes time for the other CPI components to respond. We also are going to assume that this same shock will raise household inflation expectations in the baseline model, and that is motivated by household level evidence in work by Binder 2018. The second shock is a positive shock to the core CPI. Now, when I say core CPI in this paper, that's defined as consumer prices excluding gasoline prices. That's on purpose because we're trying to isolate the effect of gasoline price shocks. Um, so what we are postulating is that such a core CPI shock will raise consumer price inflation by construction. We also assume that it raises inflation expectations. That's again based on evidence in binder. In addition, we postulate that a positive shock to the core CPI lowers the real price of gasoline on impact. That follows from evidence in Killian and Vega 2011 that nominal gasoline prices do not respond um, within the same month to inflation shocks. Now, there's a third shock in the model uh, that we call an idiosyncratic inflation expectation shock. So the idea is that sometimes inflation expectations move because people get worried about things, things like fiscal stimulus, quantitative easing. And they get worried about this not because today's prices are moving, but because that is something that might happen at some point in the future. And it might not even be true, but that doesn't mean people don't worry about it. So if you see a movement in inflation expectations that cannot be explained based on changes in current gasoline or core CPI prices, that must be what we call an idiosyncratic inflation expectation shock. And there is a micro literature that has argued that these types of shocks actually matter. Now, taking these identification assumptions together, I can write the vector of reduced form VR residuals on the left hand side as a weighted average of the vector of structural innovations, where the weighting matrix, the structural impact multiplier matrix, is restricted such that some elements are known to be zero and others are subject to sign restrictions, positive or negative sign restrictions. This type of model can be estimated by Bayesian methods using a uniform Gaussian inverse Wishart prior as described in a recent Econometrica paper by Arias et al. And that's what we're doing in this paper. The reduced form prior we work with is a conventional Minnesota prior with zero mean for the slope parameters. It can be shown that this prior is largely uninformative for the vector of structural impulse responses and therefore isn't driving our empirical results. That's important because there are some recent papers, in particular by Jim Hamilton, that argued that routinely working with priors like this will unduly influence the prior and hence the posterior of the structural impulse responses. It turns out this is not the case at all in this application. Now, having simulated the posterior distribution of these structural impulse responses, we then evaluate the joint uh, impulse response distribution under additively separable absolute loss, as discussed in recent work of mine with Atsushi Inoue, and we report the base estimate as a solid black line, and the joined credible set is approximated uh, based on a collection of red lines. So this picture here shows the 68% joint credible set along with the base estimate for the response of all variables to all shocks. But I'm going to focus on the second row now. 
The second row shows the responses to a positive nominal gasoline price shock. So what does this shock do? Well, first of all, the real price of gasoline jumps up on impact and is actually responding quite persistently over time, which makes a lot of sense. Second, headline CPI inflation jumps on impact quite noticeably, but comes down pretty quickly after about two or three months, back to about zero. And finally, you also see a clear increase in inflation expectations. And that's important because that is the first time this kind of relationship has been empirically documented. So this kind of model can be represented in many different ways, one of which, which I find appealing, is to plot actual inflation expectations, shown as a black line here, together with a counterfactual, which shows us what inflation expectations would have been if there had been no nominal gasoline price shocks ever. That's shown as a dotted uh, red line. The vertical distance between these two lines measures at each point in time the cumulative effect of gasoline price shocks up to that point in time. So if you read this picture left to right, you notice that there's a big jump in the black line in around uh, mid-1990. That represents the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein, which drove up oil and therefore gasoline prices. If you look at the corresponding red line, you can tell if that hadn't happened, well, inflation expectations would have been quite a bit lower. That makes sense. Another nice example is 1997. That was the Asian financial crisis, which lowered global demand for commodities, including crude oil, and therefore lowered gasoline prices. And what you see is that the black line is quite a bit lower than the red line, reflecting this, these events in the global oil market. You also see um, an increase in inflation expectations in the second half of the 2000s during the big surge in oil prices. And you see very nicely what happened after the collapse of oil prices in late 2014, when the black line is much lower than the red line. And finally, you see on the very right, the beginning of the pandemic, you may recall that at the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was staying at home, the gasoline price plummeted. And that's reflected in a gap between the actual and counterfactual inflation expectations. So all of this makes a lot of sense. The one episode I want to focus on for the rest of the presentation is January 2009 to March 2013. That is right after the financial crisis. Now, the reason why I care about this episode is that this is front and center in Corbyn and Gordichenko's paper. What we know is that household survey inflation expectations increased by 1.5 percentage points cumulatively over this period. What our VR model tells us that 1.4 percentage points of this increase is coming from nominal gasoline price shocks. So almost all of this change in inflation expectations is driven by gasoline prices, which is consistent with Corbyn and Gordichenko's interpretation. However, that is not what always happens. In fact, if you look at a variance decomposition based on the estimated model, you find that gasoline price shocks account for only about 40% of the variation in one year household inflation expectations, with core CPI shocks accounting for another 10% or so, the rest being idiosyncratic shocks. Why is this important? Well, remember, Koyvi and Gornichenko concluded that nearly 100% of the variation in one year household inflation expectations comes from gasoline price shocks, we are saying it's not near 100, it's more like 40. Obviously, if you talk to people, there will be some people who say, forget Koivin Gornichenko, we don't believe 42%, that's way too high. So let me try to give you some intuition why that may not be too high. It's useful to take the baseline VR model that I presented earlier and compare it to an extended model that also includes a measure of economic slack, such as the unemployment rate, UR. When you look at the 
first and the second column of the baseline model, you notice that the way we can tell what is a nominal gasoline price shock and what is a core CPI shock um, is determined by the signs in the first and second column, which are plus, plus, plus from top to bottom and minus, plus, plus in the second column. Because these signs are different, we can tell which shock is which. The second model tells us a bit more about what we might be picking up with this strategy. Because it says when you define a gasoline specific price shock, gasoline market specific price shock, then you would expect the signs for the first three model variable, which are the same as in the baseline model, to be plus, plus, plus. So such a shock would be classified as a nominal gasoline price shock. But in addition, if you look at the last column, if you looked at a positive domestic aggregate demand shock, that would also be associated with a plus, plus, plus sign pattern for the first three model variables. And so that's telling us that the nominal gasoline price shock is essentially a linear combination of gasoline specific price shocks and to positive domestic aggregate demand shocks. And since it is true that gasoline specific price shocks tend to be rare, and aggregate demand shocks are actually quite common, that would lead us to believe that the nominal gasoline price shock is actually capturing positive domestic aggregate demand shocks most of the time. And if you think about it this way, then the notion that it explains about 40% of the variation is actually quite sensible. Likewise, if you look at the AS or aggregate supply shock in the domestic economy in the second column of the extended model, you see minus plus plus, well, that's exactly the same signs as the core CPI shock. And so this core CPI shock actually is essentially capturing a negative domestic aggregate supply shock. And that again explains why we get something in the order of 10%. So these results, when you think about them a bit, do make sense. Now, obviously, we're not saying that households are sitting there and running economic models to disentangle demand and supply shocks. They don't. What households actually do, in our view, is extrapolate from the experience of the 1970s and 1980s. In the 70s and 80s, demand shocks dominated the evolution of prices of oil, of the prices of oil and gasoline. And so it's natural for households to extrapolate from that experience, saying, well, we know in the 70s and 80s, when the gas price went up, that was associated with a booming economy. And so we're going to assume a similar relationship holds. How do we know this is a reasonable story? Well, they actually papers looking at micro level household evidence showing that this response of inflation expectations is particularly pronounced among households who are old enough to have personally experienced the 1970s. And it's weaker among younger households who never experienced this. And so that suggests that this is actually something that is in the data. Now, let me add that this rule of thumb, in which equates rising gasoline prices with a strengthening economy, is not a crazy rule to work with even nowadays. If you look, for example, at the financial crisis of 2008, as discussed in the paper, the financial crisis caused exactly the same kind of pattern uh, in the data as would be picked up by this rule of thumb, and people would really have gotten it right using this rule of thumb. Now, obviously, this rule of thumb doesn't always work equally well. There are time periods when it may get things wrong. But we know that simple rules of thumb really can be optimal in models of rational inattention because it's very costly to require more information about oil and gasoline markets. And so it makes sense for rational consumers not to invest too much into this when a simple rule of thumb gets it right most of the time. Now, we report a fair bit of sensitivity analysis in the paper, um, in, in part in response to referees. Um, some referees were not happy with our identifying assumptions because they were not familiar with sign restrictions. And one alternative model we proposed is a partially identified model, meaning there's only one shock that's identified, a normal gasoline price shock where we replace the first variable, the real price of gasoline, by the percent change in the nominal price of gasoline. If you apply the 
predetermine this assumption for the price of gasoline. That is, that the price of gasoline does not respond within the same month to inflation shocks to this model. You can actually identify the nominal gasoline price shock without any further assumption. And it turns out when you do that, you get results that look basically identical to the results that I already showed you, even though it's a completely different identification scheme. There's some other things we did. We dropped the sign restrictions on inflation expectations in the baseline model. That changes some responses, but not the ones we care about. The results are essentially the same. We replaced the mean household inflation expectations by the median household inf inflation expectations. Makes no difference. We looked in, in depth at the temporal stability of the baseline model. It looks stable. We show that including measures of economic slack doesn't change anything. And finally, there was a comment we got that there is an earlier paper by Benjamin Wong in the James C. B. in 2015 that looked at the relationship between crude oil price shocks and inflation expectations. And the question was whether our results aren't in some sense already in that paper. And so we show uh, in depth that uh, they are not, in fact, the results Wong obtains are quite different from our results, which shouldn't be entirely surprising because I already showed you earlier that whether you look at crude oil prices or gasoline prices makes a big difference. And so the results are substantially different. There's no substitute for doing what we are doing. So now that we are clear on the structure of ER, let's come back to the expectations of Metat Phillips curve. And because that's one of the reasons, of course, why Corbyn and Gordichenko got into this. And so they made two points. One is if you work with household inflation expectations in the Phillips curve, you get a much better fit for actual inflation data than with professional forecasts. And the reason, presumably, for this improved fit, according to them, is that uh, gasoline prices started going up in 2009 as the economy recovered. That increase is reflected in household expectations data but not in professional expectations data. And therefore, you, assuming that this is representative for the economy at large, you can explain why there was no disinflation in the actual data. So to see whether that's true, we start by replicating their estimates for the Phillips curve. One version here uses the professional expectations data, the other version, the machine survey of consumers expectations. There are different ways you can specify the Phillips curve that doesn't matter for our argument. So I'm just going to pick the leading example here. We do one more thing. We take the fitted value, the, sorry, the fitted uh, coefficients for the second specification based on the Michigan survey of consumers, and we replace the expectations data by the counterfactual path of MSC expectations in the absence of gasoline price shocks as recovered from the VR model. So we put all these things together in one picture. Actually, this is the same picture I showed you earlier, except there's one more line. That one more line is the dotted blue line, which shows you the fitted value when you work with the Michigan Survey consumers controlling for gasoline price shocks. So let me summarize the key points uh, from this figure as follows. We can show that the Michigan Survey Consumers specification fits the data better than the SPF specification overall and for each sub -year. That's still true, as reported in Koyvin Gordichenko. However, the fit of the PC counterfactual curve differs substantially from that of the PC SPF curve. And that's really important because, in a nutshell, what Koyvin Gordichenko argued is that. Once you control for gasoline prices, these two curves should be on top of one another because all of the difference between these two expectations measures is accounted for by gasoline prices. And that is far from being the case. That's a direct rejection of their main result. Now, when you look more closely, you see that um, only 39% of the improved fit from using the Michigan Survey of Consumers in 2009-2010 is due to gasoline price shocks. However, if you look at 2011-1 through 2013-1, you find actually you're worse off by taking account uh, of the gasoline price shocks. And overall, uh, for the entire period, 2009 to 2013, 
it's a wash. It makes no difference. So what do we take away from this? Well, the key point is that the timing and magnitude of the cumulative effect of gasoline price shocks on household inflation expectations is not consistent with these shocks explaining the improved fit of the Phillips curve based on household data. So there must be a reason why household expectations data give you a much better fit, but it has nothing to do with gasoline prices. That's in a way that, uh, what we arrive at. So let me summarize the main points. So first we showed that the existing evidence in the literature for a causal link from the level of the price of oil or price of gasoline to inflation expectations must be disregarded. We used to think this is a firmly established fact. It's not a fact at all. Second, we re-examined this link using a structural VR that addresses the shortcomings of early analysis. We showed that gasoline price shocks are one important determinant of the short-run inflation expectations, but they're not the most important determinant as commonly believed. Moreover, their importance changes over time. Um, they actually explain most of what's going on between 2009 and 2013, but that is not the reason for the improved fit of the Phillips curve augmented by household inflation expectations. Now, let me spend the rest of my slides talking a bit about another paper, a more recent paper, and that is somewhat related. Uh, that more recent paper, um, also with Xiao Jingzhou at the Dallas Fed, looks at the impact of rising oil prices on U.S. inflation and inflation expectations in 2020 to 23. So the background is that if you go back to October of 21, we saw the price of West Texas Intermediate crude oil rising above $80 a barrel. And at that point, people started worrying that the oil price may climb as high as $100 a barrel this winter, the winter of 21, uh, 22. So why do people think that? It turns out the story behind this uh, scenario of $100 oil has evolved a little bit over time. But let me give you some of the leading explanations. There's an argument that power plants and maybe firms in Europe and Asia will be switching to using petroleum products in response to a shortage of coal and in particular natural gas. Uh, the, the coal shortage is more in Asia. It has abated a little bit recently. The natural gas shortage affects Europe in particular. And so what we have in mind here is that there are power plants that use natural gas under normal circumstances uh, to run turbines, but in principle, you could use fuel oil or even diesel uh, to run them instead if the price difference between natural gas and fuel uh, oils would be substantial enough. And so how big is that uh, of a deal? I don't know. The people I talk to in the United States, in the industry, seem to think that the degree to which people can substitute is actually somewhat limited, but that's something the market seems to worry about. Another um, new feature is that the recovery from Omicron appears to be faster than expected initially. We have countries such as Denmark, for example, opening up, reducing restrictions, and undoubtedly, this is going to lead to an increase in demand for fuels. There is a parallel concern that OPEC Plus, which has agreed to increase its supply by 400,000 uh, barrels of oil per month, every month, is actually not able to deliver on those supply targets. So what they say they're going to pump is more than what they actually seem to be able to pump. Uh, there's also concern about a fallout from the Ukraine crisis for the oil market. Some of that discussion is a little bit confused because people mix up natural gas and oil. Um, as far as oil is concerned, the main concern seems to be either that uh, Russia would decide not to sell any oil anymore, which seems unlikely since this is their main um, way of earning foreign exchange at this point, or the sanctions which make, would make it more difficult for Russia to sell oil, reducing the supply of oil in the market. Now, be that as it may, as far back as October 1st, Bank of America argued 
that the oil could surge above $100 a barrel in the event of a cold winter and could spark inflation. And you can find similar views when talking to Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. JP Morgan had a, an article just this morning arguing it could be much higher than that. Barclay, or, or for that matter, BlackRock. Right? All these guys seem to be uh, very bullish on uh, oil prices and, and seem to think this is something to worry about. So why would macroeconomists care? Well, if you have a surge in oil demand or a drop in supply, combined with low oil inventories, oil inventories are right now quite low, and anemic growth in U.S. shale oil production for a number of reasons, that certainly could push the oil price to $100 per barrel. And if you saw such an increase, the resulting increase in gasoline prices could potentially push U.S. inflation higher for extended periods. And when that happens, you start worrying that inflation expectations may become embedded in the wage and price setting process. And just over the last couple of days, there has been a flurry of press articles talking about the infamous wage price spiral as a driver of inflationary pressures. So all of this potentially could be triggered by higher oil prices. There have been plenty of warnings about this, but actually no quantitative analysis of this scenario. And so that's what I'm going to look at right now. There are really two questions here. One is, to what extent have shocks to the gasoline price affected U.S. inflation and inflation expectations since the beginning of the pandemic? And how much further would a rise in the price of oil to $100 in the winter of 21-22 increase inflation at inflation expectations? And just how persistent would these effects be over the next two years? And that was a question we started looking into in November of last year when there were the first reports about $100 oil. So I'm going to address this with an extended version of the partially identified VR model I showed you earlier. Um, that model it will include the percent change in the price of gasoline, headline CPI inflation, poor CPI inflation, and one year and five year Michigan survey household inflation expectations. So the first thing to do is to look at the impulse responses. Uh, they look pretty similar to the stuff that I showed you earlier. When you have a, a positive gasoline price shock, you get an immediate jump in headline CPI inflation, which quickly dies out. Uh, there is no evidence of uh, real secondary spikes in inflation that you might associate with a wage price spiral if it existed. You see a much more muted and not precisely estimated response in core CPI inflation. And you see clear responses in both one-year and five-year inflation expectations. But of course, the response in five-year inflation expectations is quite small and also much less precisely estimated. Um, you can do different versions of the model where you work with PCE data. We did that as well. This is just an example. So the next question is, well, how do you model a scenario for $100 oil in the future? Well, you start with where the price of oil is right now in September of 21, uh, which was the most recent data we had when this paper was written. And then we postulate that the price of oil will evolve by gradually increasing in the rest of the year, reaching $100 in December, staying at $100 in January and February, and in March, when spring comes, gradually declining to a long run level of $80. Uh, let me add that you can make the long run lower if you like, that's not gonna affect uh, what is gonna happen over the next two years very much. Now, how do we map this scenario for the oil price into gasoline prices? Well, we look at the percent change in the oil price implied by this scenario, we observe that the cost share of oil in producing gasoline is 50%. That tells us if the WTI price goes up by 100%, we would expect the gasoline price to go up uh, by 50%. And so we can back out the path of gasoline prices from that. So that allows us to look at two things. Uh, notice there is a vertical line in the middle of this picture. 
that separates the historical data, which are to the left, from the similar data, which are to the right. So let's start in early 2020. That's when the pandemic hit. If you look at the headline CPI, that is the black line, you see a big drop in the headline CPI associated with falling gasoline prices. You hit rock bottom in about May of 2020. That's when the recovery started. Then you see a rapid recovery. Of course, initially you're still below normal, but by early 21, you start getting into positive territory. Um, you see the CPI uh, rising um, to uh, below 2% and then flattening off in late 21. If you then go into the scenario, that would imply a resurgence in inflation uh, going up to 3%, reaching a peak in December of 21. But then throughout 22, you would start seeing a decline in the headline CPI. And the reason you start seeing a decline is that oil and gasoline prices are no longer going up. They actually either flat or going down, which implies that you start seeing mean reversion. And by 23, you're basically back to normal. There's nothing going on anymore. You see a very similar picture if you do the headline PCE, which is closer to what the Fed would be concerned with, except everything is more muted. And, and that, of course, reflects the weights for different expenditure components in the PCE versus the CPI. And if you look at the core CPI or maybe the trim mean PCE, for example, uh, measures of core inflation, you see that they do go down in 2020 and early 21. Uh, but uh, much, much less. Uh, they do start going up a, a little bit more in 22, however, and even a little bit in 23. So this gives a, a pretty good idea of what this would do to uh, inflation. Um, here is an overview table where instead I give you the annual inflation rates for 21, 22, and 23. That's a bit of a mix of historical data and simulated data. So if you start with headline CPI inflation, you see 21, you see a big increase in inflation, CPI inflation of 3%. That makes sense because you, you start from a very low level and the economy is recovering. But for 22, that drops to 0.4, that's quite modest, and 23 is actually minus 0.2. So basically, this will be over. It's not going to be persistent. If you look at the PCE inflation instead, also headline, you get numbers that are quite a bit smaller. It's 1.8 for 21, and then you get 0.4 and 0.1 for 22 and 23, essentially the same picture. Now, of course, if you look at core inflation measures, that changes the picture considerably. Um, that essentially is taking out the immediate fluctuations in oil and gasoline prices. Um, that uh, gives you 0.4 or 0.3, depending on which measure you look at for 21, that's the green stuff, you get 0.3 or 0.4 and 22, and you get 0.1 to at most 0.3 in 23. So that suggests, again, this is a very temporary phenomenon. Also interesting is the blue lines. Uh, that's our one-year and five-year inflation expectations. Um, you see a clear response of 0.6 in one year inflation expectations going up to 0.8 in 22 before coming back down. If you look at long term, namely five year inflation expectations, that's much more stable. It hardly moved in 21 and it moves very little about 0.1 in 22 and 23. So, so far there is no indication that this type of event would destabilize long term inflation expectations. Um, of course, the event I'm talking about here is and a sequence of oil price shocks. Obviously, there could be other reasons why you might worry about inflation becoming stabilized that have nothing to do with oil and gasoline markets. So let me stop here and we can open the floor to general discussion. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, seminar. So it's very interesting also because uh, you, I have to say that uh, you answer also some of my question related to uh, what could happen uh, you know, in these days. But uh, Eva, I know that there are uh, some colleagues that uh, would like to, to ask you something uh, by uh, putting, um, switching on 
their um, video, video camera. Uh, before uh, doing this, uh, um, a, a comment. So uh, you demonstrate. So you have shown us that uh, the gasoline is a, is a uh, good predictor in, in sense of uh, so expectation. How the expectation is uh, weighted also on uh, the um, the the movement of uh, the gasoline prices. Uh, so is uh, in my mind is also also manner to answer why in some cases so, uh, even if uh, we have uh, some uh, increased uh, changes of uh, oil prices, we have not a direct effect on uh, expectation because uh, you have uh, you need uh, a second uh, step uh, and the second step is an uh, effect on the gasoline. Um, and also, uh, this could also explain uh, um, why in some cases we have uh, uh, the opposite effect. But one co one question is, uh, what about the gas um, gas prices? Because uh, yes, now the yes. prices, yeah. yeah, only gas. So, so gasoline, gasoline, yeah. depending on oil, okay, they're strongly related. But uh, uh, this uh, you have uh, shown as of a 40, 39 percent of the expectation is. Uh, uh, depends on uh, gasoline price, uh, uh, but it's also part of that depends on the gas because maybe gas and oil prices sometimes many times are related, uh, but sometimes they move in this different direction depending also on uh, the political situation. So, for example, now in this period of uh, Ukraine problem, uh, um, and so maybe this could uh, affect more gas with respect to other cases. Maybe this could create. Uh, some uh, effect on uh, expectation, inflation expectation. And the second point, very quickly, and uh, um, respond to this first before you get to your second point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that might be easier. So the results I showed you were for the United States. For the United States, since the 2000s, the traditional relationship between the natural gas market and the oil market has broken down, meaning natural gas prices evolve quite differently, typically, from oil prices over the gasoline prices. And so for the analysis I presented to you, that is not a concern. One key difference is that the oil market is clearly a global market. The natural gas market is a regional market. There is a regional market in North America, and there is a regional market uh, tying together Europe, Russia, maybe to a lesser extent China, mostly Europe and Russia. And one can make the case that the relationship between natural gas prices and oil prices is stronger for Europe than it would be for the United States. And that's something one would need to look at more carefully. One problem with that is that when you're thinking about oil prices in global markets versus domestic inflation in Europe, you have to account for the exchange rate. And so if I were to look at that, it, I would argue it would make much more sense to look at domestic gasoline prices in Europe uh, versus domestic inflation in Europe, leaving out the oil price completely because the mapping from the trade in oil and US dollars and global markets to the retail price of gasoline is more complicated than in the case of the US because the exchange rate is moving around as well. And the same potentially is true for natural gas, depending on how that trade is denominated. So the empirical analysis would be a little bit different. I don't have a good sense for how connected the oil and gas markets are uh, in Europe. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's, it's exactly one of the questions. And uh, the, the forecast for the inflation, depending on this shock, the shock of the, with the it's uh, one of the last uh, slides that you have shown. Is uh, a short run effect. It's uh, understood well, no? It's uh, the, the yeah, so in a nutshell, you can say as long as the oil price keeps going up, you will see increased inflation. Once the oil price stops going up, almost immediately, increase in inflation will start reversing. So this notion that there will be persistent effects for extended periods, that doesn't happen by itself. For that to happen, presumably. Uh, you would need this to be reflected in long-term expectations, long-term inflation expectations, right? Once that happens, then the process becomes self-sustaining, if you like. Okay. And so people have talked about this a lot. In, in fact, in, in the 80s, people wrote papers about wage price spirals, which were intended to explain sustained high unemployment in Europe. 
in response to oil price shocks. And the usual argument was that uh, an oil price shock is reflected in higher prices. But then unions come in and saying, we're not going to accept anything less than an increase in wages that offsets that price increase. And then a firm say, well, we want to retain our markup. And you basically end up in a situation where the real wage, nominal wage divided by prices, remains constant and above the market clearing level. And the only way then to clear the market is by having unemployment. Now, I don't know to what extent that argument was true in Europe. That may depend on which country you're talking about. I mean, the UK might be closest in terms of the conditions that people appeal to when they write down this model. I don't think it was ever intended to be applied to the United States. In fact, when you look at data for the response of the real wage to oil price sharks, it was shown by Rottenberg and Woodford many years ago already that the real wage went down in response to oil price sharks. And so this is really not the story for the US in the 70s or 80s or now. I think if you're starting to see a wage price spiral in the United States, it is more related to the pandemic, right, if that were to happen, right? And the fact that there are supply bottlenecks that don't want to go away or uh, that the shortages in the labor market are not going away, and that becomes embedded in expectations. It's a little bit of a different story, though, than the original story, which was all about something like an oil price shock triggering this. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now I leave the floor to uh, Alessio D'Amato. Uh, so if I ask to Alessio to switch on his camera. Uh, Alessio is uh, the president of the Italian Association of Environmental Resource Economists. Now I know that he has a question. Uh, question. Otherwise, I wait for a second. Otherwise, we have other questions that are. Uh, oh, you can just read it if you know what the question is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I know that. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, he's... Okay. Now you should be able to hear me. Yes. Sorry. Thanks a lot. Very, very challenging and uh, very interesting uh, uh, webinar. I I've learned a lot of things. Uh, basically, I am not an expert in uh, the specific field of this. Uh, webinar, but I found it uh, really intriguing. Uh, I am basically, as uh, maybe Sergio was saying, uh, an environmental economist. So uh, this is why my questions are a bit away from the uh, the methodologies and a little bit more into uh, the possible uh, environmental sides of your speech. My first question, I have two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, do you think that uh, climate, the credibility of climate policy can play a role in explaining the linkages between uh, uh, gasoline price shocks and inflation, expect, uh, inflation expectation in the long term? And uh, the second question is, uh, uh, U.S. have a, a history of unconventional uh, fossil fuels, whether also the availability and shocks in the availability of unconventional fossil fuels may play a role in explaining this link between a short-run oil price or um, gasoline price shocks and long-term expectation for inflation. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so to a first approximation, environmental policies matter to the extent that they explain that not more oil is being produced. And so a good example would be the inability or unwillingness of oil producers in the United States, in particular shale oil producers, to strongly increase oil production, even though the price is actually quite high at this point. Why is that happening? Well, uh, if they try to secure the necessary capital, for example, for an expansion of production, then many uh, traditional investors in the industry will now say, yeah, but we don't really want to be in fossil fuels. We prefer a greener technology, right? And so the cost of financing has gone up. And that helps explain why the response from US shale oil producers has been quite muted. So um, that says something, if you like, about the uh, 
persistence of oil price increases. And you might argue that environmental policies could, at least at some point, if they don't do it now, um, make price increases for oil more persistent. And if that were the case, right, that uh, could explain um, some structural change, if you like, in the response of inflation expectations to oil and gasoline price shocks. I don't think we're there yet. It's certainly something that it would be conceivable. Thanks. It would be great to have the possibility to, uh, because this seems to suggest in some way that we are not yet to the level where the credibility of climate policies is such to, persist to persistently affect the price, the inflation expectations. But this is very interesting. So thanks a lot. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I would say the credibility of climate policies suffers from the fact that even if you believe in them, it seems very difficult to implement substantial changes at short horizons. And, and they're very practical reasons, right? If you look at the number of cars on the road, is it really feasible to make everyone drive an electric car? Well, that would mean you would need to expand the production of these cars tremendously. That would put tremendous pressure on the resources required for that. It would put tremendous pressures on the electric grid. Um, for this to be sensible, it better not be the case that the electricity is generated by coal power plants. So you will need major changes in the structure of power plants. But we know that building a new power plant takes at least 10 years, right? And so it's very hard to see big changes in energy consumption coming from climate policies for, let's say, the next 10 years or so. Whether that's desirable or not is, is kind of not the issue. It's a feasibility issue. And I think that's why the market in general is not responding all that much to this. And they understand that even though maybe oil consumption is not going to grow sky high, it's probably going to remain stable for the foreseeable future. Is there just no other way short of shutting down the economy? Now, it is true that, of Thanks. course, if you, make, if you make it difficult for companies to refinance them, uh, oil companies to refinance themselves, that will have real effects, even in the short run. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Alessio. Uh, okay, now uh, we have uh, another question uh, with uh, um, Professor Guerini from the University of uh, Brescia. Now I ask uh, to Mattia to uh, switch on his camera. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thanks okay. a lot again. I, I put myself in the line after who preceded me in, in uh, thanking you for the very nice presentation. And uh, uh, actually, I mean, my questions are more technical. Uh, I solemnly swear that I'm not referee one, but uh, I also have a question about the identification strategy. Uh, yeah. I mean, I see that you were using uh, uh, the sun restriction hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder whether you consider about using uh, uh, other kind of identification strategies, which are less theory driven, but rather they are uh, they are data driven. For example, in the in the recent past, there has been the paper by by Lutkepol using. Uh, either heteroscedasticity or non gaussianity for the identification of structural VAR. Uh, otherwise, there has been the paper by, by Jorda on using the local projections. So I wonder whether you tested uh, the robustness of, uh, of your results with respect to these uh, alternatives. And uh, uh, the, the second, again, technical point, but I think it's much more related to what you have been discussing in the in the second part of your of your discussion, so of your of your second paper, uh, which is more in relation with the with the macroeconomy, uh, in your let's say first model that you have estimated in the structure of VAR, you have a number of shocks which is exactly the same number uh, of of the equations of the variables. Uh, I mean, uh, actually, you can even add the number of shocks and maybe take into account a classical demand shock. And uh, uh, this, I think, would put uh, your model more, uh, more much into perspective 
also with respect to the to the second part of your presentation, uh, that, uh, which was which was I think inspiring also the the relation with the WSPS uh, and all this uh, and all this stuff. Thanks a lot again. Yeah. So let me start with this second question. Um, in the paper, I propose several alternative models. I don't know about ten or so in total. Um, including a model that fits the bill of what you asked for, which is an empirically driven identification that does not involve sign restrictions. That was the partially identified model that I mentioned earlier and that is being extended in the last part of the presentation. In this context of this model, you can include measures of economic slack in the VAR specification and we show that this does not affect our results. So basically, the results look alike. So in that sense, we have done this already. So you might say, why did you not estimate the extended model of economic slack and sign restrictions? Um, the reason is that we are working with relatively short estimation periods and large models. And as an econometrician, you don't want to ask too much of the data by pushing the envelope and just estimating too many things. So we didn't try to estimate that bigger model. One could have done this. I would have worried about the model becoming too big because remember, we have 12 lags. And so if you add uh, more equations, that starts adding up. Um, regarding Helmut Lukopol, uh, as, as you may have seen, he's my co-author on a book on structural ERs. So yes, I know this literature well. Um, when you try to estimate, to identify a VR based on non-Gaussianity, or based on heteroscelasticity. Uh, it turns out that you're getting a unique solution, but that unique solution doesn't necessarily have an economic interpretation. So you might say, if I took a model and I applied an ad hoc Trulesky decomposition, I'm also getting a unique solution for a particular ordering, but it doesn't mean the results make economic sense. So people who use models identified by non-Gaussianity and heteroscedasticity typically then appeal to other work to saying, for example, Helmut did that in one of his papers where he said, well, I'm estimating this oil market model identified based on heteroscedasticity. I don't really know which shock is doing what, but this surely looks like that shock identified in this paper by Killian or oil markets. And therefore I think it's a demand shock, right? So, Identification by heteroscedasticity and non-Gaussianity in general is not a full-fledged alternative. It's more like a robustness check, right? Because if you do this and you get the same result that people have gotten by other means, that tells you that the results by other means look credible. Now, we have not done this in our context uh, to see what happens um, because we had enough different ways of doing it that all produced uh, robust results. On local projections, as in the work of Oscar Jordan, um, the different versions of local projections, uh, some versions can be shown to be asymptotically equivalent to a VR. Now, first, if the true model were a VR, they can be shown to be asymptotically equivalent to a VR. We do that in our textbook on structural VRs. There is more recent work by Michael plagberg meller who shows even when the true model is not a VR, they're still asymptotically equivalent. The question then is, well, how do you choose between them? And there are multiple issues. One is there is potentially a bias variance trade-off in the estimation between a local projection and a structural VR. Uh, intuitively, it depends a lot on how well the data are actually approximated by a structural VR model in the first place. The better they are approximated by a structural VR model, the harder it is for the LP approach to, to show any gains. The second has to do with the implementation. It has been argued that in principle, you can use local projections, for example, for sign restrictions. Um, I think the jury on that is still out a little bit because when I use sign restrictions in a structural VR, I impose all restrictions simultaneously. Uh, so you have to be careful when you do this with a local projection to also impose this simultaneously. And the reason why this is tricky is because you're working with a panel of regressions. 
So the examples I've seen of sign restrictions in that context have been one sign restriction on one response, not a lot of sign restrictions on many responses, or a mixture of zero restrictions and sign restrictions. Maybe that can be done, but there's a lot more work to be done to make this operational at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, indeed, one of the questions indeed was because I also work myself with non Goshanity uh, to identify, and indeed, at the very end, uh, you end up to, to relabel the shocks uh, thanks to some theory. I mean, uh, even when you, when you are completely uh, data driven, either you, you assume some uh, uh, impossibility of, uh, so you use a, a, a DAG model, so you assume acyclicality of shocks. Uh, and in a I, way, it's, this, it's, this may, I mean, the labeling based on theory, you have to be careful because it may not work sometimes. So a classical example is you're saying there's a shift in the variance in 1979, right? You're in revolution and all that. Well, if you talk to Hamilton, he's going to say, yeah, that reflects the, the big supply shock, right? It's a supply shock regime. And you talk to me, I will tell you, no, it's a demand shock regime. Well, that's precisely what determines which shock is which, right? And that means you haven't learned anything from the data. So there are cases... I think in particular when you do monetary policy, where it's easier to argue for the interpretation of some of these shocks, in fully structural models like the ones we're working with here, it tends to be a little bit harder. I see. But Thanks I'm not so saying much. it's impossible. I mean, I'm just saying it takes work. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Mattia. Uh, now I would like to thank you, Professor Killer. We collected other questions I sent to you. We will send to you in order to, to answer also to the question because now uh, we are half past five, so we, we are agreeing to, to close now. I thank you all the participants, a very high number. Thank you very much, Professor Killian. We will keep in touch, so you are formally invited here, the library of FEMA, so we, you, you can you want to come here. You are invited. We will uh, um, send to you other um, meeting uh, um, uh, invitation also for our project on, uh, on other interview. So thank you very much again for your interesting, very interesting uh, seminar. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.